how can we optimize ourselves personally to live the happiest, healthiest, longest life possible? What does that look like? What are ethical ways of doing that? What are unethical ways of doing that? You know, where are the slippery slopes? I'm Nick Gillespie, and today I'm talking with Jane Metcalf. She's a co-founder of Wired Magazine and the co-recipient of the very first Lenny Friedlander Prize from Reason. Metcalf's newest venture is Neo.Life, a website that chronicles what she calls the neobiological revolution, the many ways that technology, medicine, and new forms of knowledge are radically expanding human longevity and the quality of life. Jane, thanks for talking. Thanks for inviting me. What are the main facets of the neobiological revolution? The basis of neolife is that uh, computer science and engineering thinking has invaded biology. What are the similarities? What are the differences? And how do we think about biology and human life differently if we start thinking about code? You know, we discover DNA. Back in the 50s, you know, in the early aughts, we learned how to read the code. Mm -hmm. Now we're learning how to write the code. How does that change things? Human beings have been evolving forever. The difference is the rate of acceleration and something very, very specific, which is our ability now to edit the human genome and to edit not just what's happening in our own bodies now, but to pass those edits on to subsequent generations. And that's germline engineering, where Correct. it's like we can change what our bodies are and everything that comes out of them. Exactly. Recent pieces on the site, common theme seems to be individual empowerment. One piece is called Power to the Patients, and it's about a guy who has cancer and is fighting for certain aspects. Another is called Women Finally Get the Fertility Test They Deserve. Why is power shifting towards patients, towards women, towards individuals? What, what, is, what is going on there? Well, two things, really. One is that so much of our existing system is just broken. In the case of the man who's the power to the patients, he's got a rare disease. He's got a rare genetic mutation. There's maybe 10,000 people in America, 100,000 people worldwide. That may not be enough to justify a pharmaceutical investment in research to address his, his problem. That's called an orphan disease, and it's just they're kind of just left dealing with the symptoms. And so in today's day and age, you can sequence your genome, you can sequence the genome of your tumors, and you can start to use the tools of big data and artificial intelligence, machine learning, to try and see patterns and correlations and ultimately causations that can help you understand not only what's causing the disease, but also potentially which drugs could best address the disease. And it, it seems it's all of a piece as well. I mean, in every other aspect of our lives, we're, we're moving from kind of mass to niche, right? Yeah. So we don't all drink the same coffee. We don't all dress the same anymore. We can get personalized this and that. So why not? That's right. And there may medicine. have been, you know, a handful of artisanal coffee brands, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of made it on a national scale. But there's I can't even imagine how many thousands of coffee brands now, and they may be very localized, and that may be enough to support their brand. It's not a women's site, but it very much speaks to women as well as men. A lot of political stuff, a lot of medical stuff assumes a masculine audience. For a long time, it seemed like in the medical space, women were kind of told to shut up and just sit there while doctors worked on that. It's because right? women were considered small men. Mm -hmm. Female astronauts talked about being given suits that were size small for men. Well, there's some very fundamental differences right. there. Women need drugs in different quantities. They may need different drugs entirely. And so what happens when women are the doctors, when women are the researchers, when women are running the companies? You know, it turns out you get better products for women. Right. You know, what, yeah. what a great Surprise. thing that is. Well, and it's interesting that like in primatology and whatnot for a long time, all, you know, all, all of the early primatologists were mostly men or if they were women, you know, but they all looked at the male chimps and then it's like something is odd when you look at, oh, well, look at, you know, female chimps. They have their own behavior as well and it's just kind of an interesting catch up. Uh, I mean, one of the things I like about the site is that it's not about men or pretending that men are the universal subject. That it, it includes much more than that. I mean, I see so many women at the leading edge of developments in health and medicine and, you know, biology. And mm -hmm. the J.P. Morgan Health Conference that just took place, you know, the big, uh, takeaway there was that there were more men named Mike speaking than there were female CEOs mm. speaking. I mean, it was just the numbers are crazy. And, you know, at the power structures, at the largest companies, that's still the case. But what I look at is where's the energy? Where are the emergent uh, companies, the emergent technologies, the emergent researchers? You know, where are the companies that are addressing unmet needs? And so many of those are being run by women. You recently interviewed Craig Venter, who famously sequenced the human genome and did it- uh, His own. Yeah, more quickly and yeah. cheaper than, than a government program to do, the, which was working in parallel. Technically, it was a tie. Yes, but 
Well, the money was cheaper, but in any, or, you know, on his side. But uh, one of the things he's talking about, which is really kind of exciting and bizarre to think about, is a $5,000 checkup that will detect zero stage cancer. The first time I read that, I was like, okay, you know, how do you even know it's there if it hasn't, you know, moved past zero stage? He says in, in the interview that it's something like 5% of people over 50 have some kind of life-threatening cancer or condition that they don't even know about. And so this $5,000 checkup could save your life. Is that kind of stuff, you know, is it going to, and I guess this is a selfish question a long way around, is, <laughs> is this stuff going to become cheap enough and ubiquitous enough and effective enough rapidly? I mean, like, is this happening now or is this all kind of, you know, in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years? So Human Longevity Inc. had a program um, called the human uh, the the health nucleus it's still called mm -hmm. the nucleus it used to cost twenty five thousand dollars now you're getting almost all of that for five thousand mm -hmm. so it initially cost two billion dollars to sequence the human genome then they got it down to 125 million you know then they got it down to twenty five thousand now there's a company that'll sequence your whole genome for a thousand dollars and that it's just you know it's like the cost of a cell phone call so you're saying I should wait uh, yeah, you if know, you don't have anything in particular, get, yeah. you could wait, because uh, I do think those prices are falling rapidly. You know, the question that a lot of people have is, is this coming up with things that might never actually manifest? And so, you know, there's a phrase for it. It's called incidentaloma. It's mm. the, uh, you know, it's the tumor right. you get that might never develop into something mm. that threatens your health in any way. So are we overreacting? Are we treating things that, you know, in other circumstances we would wait for symptoms? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if people are finding tumors, if people are finding risk of heart disease and other things, then there's things that you can do to help, you know, prevent those things from developing. Where do you fall on the, the kind of scale of like unbridled human intervention into the stuff of life versus a more cautious approach? Inventor himself is you know, he's both obviously at the forefront of this, but he's also a little bit nervous about some of the interventions we might make because, uh, you know, and a recent story, or maybe not so recent, but uh, you, uh, at uh, Neolife was about the, the Frankenstein story and the golden yeah. stories. Will we ever get past that idea that we, we should not be messing with our own genes or with our own life? Well, I think there's a big difference, and you can draw a great mm -hmm. big difference line between collecting the information and doing something about it. Mm -hmm. And so right now we're in the collect the information phase. And if you're paying $5,000, you're paying a premium for something that's gonna cost a little bit less you know, soon. It's sort of the early adopter premium, but there's another reason for doing it, which is establishing a baseline. And then there's a third reason for doing it, which is you are advancing the science. Mm -hmm. And you know they may find something in your genome that can help unlock a secret or a mystery. And you, know, you get the benefit of a sort of, you know, peek into what could potentially happen in the second half of your life. Have you had it done? I have. And did you find anything like, I'm not, I'm not the person I thought I was? Uh, no, I'm a supreme being, and that's yeah. pretty much what okay. my genome tells yeah. me. However, there were a few things that had I known them before I had children, I would have sweated about it throughout my entire pregnancy. <laughs> so I'm just as soon, I'm glad I, yeah. I waited. You know, a friend of mine is a swimmer, and she found out she had stage zero esophageal cancer, which is apparently a risk for swimmers who are inhaling chlorine all the time. So she did intervene and she's glad for it. Hmm. You know, Craig Venter himself found prostate cancer. That's also something that's good to, to do early. Would it not have advanced? Who knows? Um, I think it's, those are individual decisions. I just think having the power is what's important. Wired is, uh, turns 25 this year, right? This 2019, month. 2019, this month, in January of 2018. As much as it chronicled the digital revolution, it also kind of heralded it and helped create it. What is, is, is there a continuity between what you were doing at Wired and what you're doing now at Neolife? Absolutely, absolutely. In the same way that Wired didn't just cover the technology, we're not just covering the science. We wanna cover all the aspects around it. There are a lot of cultural responses to this stuff. I mean, you can see this explosion of television shows and movies and books about you know AI and robots and you know what happens when we start editing our genome and so forth. You know, there's huge ethical, moral and ethical conversations that need to take place. There are design issues. If we're going to start editing ourselves, our species, well then what would we like that to look like? Mm. And so let's start Well, if it's those... like early computers, everything will be putty colored. Right? Yeah, exactly. You know, and we don't have to wait maybe 20 years to get colorful computers. And sold on the basis of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, mm -hmm. right? That FUD factor is what drove everybody to buy IBM. You know, <laughs> it's like if we drive everybody to do something because they're afraid of what's in their genome, 
That's quite different than if we focus on how can we optimize ourselves personally to live the happiest, healthiest, longest life possible, to be as smart as we possibly can and to carry that forward to our children. You know, what does that look like? What are ethical ways of doing that? What are unethical ways of doing that? You know, where are the slippery slopes? So I want Neolife to be not, again, like Wired, not just covering the science or the technology, but covering the broader issues, but also keeping touch with, you know, that leading edge because it's so incredibly exciting.